Let's start by just reviewing some things that you already know from the principles of microeconomics class. In this class, in intermediate micro, essentially what we're going to do is go through the, the same topics that we go through in a principles of micro class, but we're going to, going to go through them in, in quite a bit more depth. And there will be a few things that we talk about that you typically don't see in a principles class, or at least if you did see them, it was just to barely introduce them, things like utility maximization and um, cost minimization for a firm. Sometimes those get mentioned in a principles class, but it's usually not until an intermediate class where we really go through those in depth. So let's start by just kind of reviewing some of what we know from a principles class, and I always like to start by thinking about what the definition of economics is. And the definition that we're going to use is that economics is simply the study of human behavior. It's not unusual if I meet somebody and uh, they ask me what I do and I say I'm an economist, they almost always will, will say something like, oh, do you have any good stock tips? And I always play along and, and you know, I, I know that most people don't have any idea about what economics really is. And most people believe that it's, it's somehow the study of the financial system or, or banks or the stock market. And in economics, we do study those things. But the only reason that we study them is because they have to do with human behavior and large amounts of money typically being transacted. But at its most basic level, economics is just the study of human behavior. So keep that in mind as we go through this. We're always going to be thinking about why people make the decisions that they do, and we know from a principles class that people respond to incentives. And as those incentives change, um, behavior often changes. So the basic foundation of, of human behavior, and we'll talk about this, this will be a theme that pops up throughout this class, is that a, a decision maker takes an action, I'm, I'm going to say take an action, if and only if the marginal benefit of that action is greater than the marginal cost. Take an action if and only if the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. Now, hopefully you remember from a principles class that the marginal benefit is the change in benefit or the additional benefit. Anytime we use the word marginal in economics, similar to the way it's used in mathematics, the word marginal is used to refer to a change in. Okay? So you take an action if and only if that action adds more to your benefit than it adds to your cost. Now the important thing, and we'll talk about this later on in, in the uh, semester, the important thing is that this does not say that you take an action if and only if the total benefit is bigger than the total cost. That's not how human behavior is determined. Because typically as you're engaging in behavior, you have no idea what the total benefits and total costs are going to end up being. If you always knew what the total benefit and the total cost were, were going to be, then things might be different, but you don't. There's uncertainty and things occur over time. And so the way that people make this decision is to think at the margin. So you take a decision if the marginal benefit is bigger than the marginal cost. One of the things that you've heard discussed in a principles class would be the difference between micro and macro. And we need to review that at the beginning. And hopefully you remember that in micro we're simply looking at the small picture. We're looking at individual human behavior. And we typically think about how the behavior of individuals, when they come together and make transactions, what that looks like in a market context. And then we often think about how different types of markets work. So in a principles class, you would have talked about perfect competition. And you would have talked about monopoly and monopolistic competition and oligopoly. And we'll review those. Those are all micro concepts. Macro really is just looking at the big picture where you're thinking about how an entire economy works. So you could think about the world economy and how 
different economies interact with each other. So clearly we're going to be thinking about the micro picture here. As we go through the videos, I'm going to use some symbols that I use when I lecture face to face, when I put these videos together. They're, these are symbols that essentially make it easier for me to get things on the board in a reasonable amount of time. And the two most common that I'm going to use are going to be this symbol, a Greek delta. And that symbol I'm simply going to use to stand for the phrase change in. This symbol can also be used to stand in for the word marginal because marginal just simply means change in. This, the marginal benefit is the change in benefit. Okay, so I could write that with a little Greek delta there. If you've had a calculus class, and I realize that calculus isn't a prerequisite for this, but if you've had a calculus class, you will have seen that. You would have seen things like dy dx, which is exactly the same idea, except here we're using a Greek or an English D instead of a Greek D. But this is just the change in Y when you change X. It's a slope. We'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. But this symbol, the uh, triangle, I'm going to use to stand for the word, the phrase change in. I'm also going to use this symbol, S with a little line through the bottom of it. And that simply means suppose. If you've had any economics classes, you know, to, know that we tend to make assumptions. We tend to suppose things to begin with. So let's suppose there are only two people in this market, or let's suppose that there's only one firm in the market. And so as we set out these assumptions that we're going to make, I'm going to use that symbol quite a bit. Um, there will be a few others that you've probably already seen. I'll use, when it comes time, I'll use a Greek pi to indicate profit, but I'll introduce, any other ones I'll introduce when it comes time. One of the things that we do in an intermediate micro course is we take the theory that you learn in a principles of microeconomics course and we essentially work through some of the math of it. So in a, a principles class, you would have thought a lot about, say, the demand and supply model. So we've got a demand curve and a supply curve. We typically have price on the vertical axis and quantity on the horizontal axis. And so what we know is that if we look at the intersection of the demand curve and the supply curve, that gives us the equilibrium price, which I'm going to call P star, and the equilibrium quantity Q star. And in a principles class, you would have talked about the determinants of demand, the things that shift demand curves. You would have talked about the determinants of supply, the things that shift the supply curve. And then you would have worked through some problems. So we might say, you know, let's suppose that this is um, demand for, or the market for a normal good and consumer incomes go up. Well, consumer incomes are a determinant of demand, and since this is a normal good, if incomes go up, demand increases, so we draw a new demand curve. So we could say demand increases from D1 to D2, and that brings us from this initial equilibrium, which we could call A, up here to a new equilibrium, we'll call it B, and then we get a new price and a new quantity, and we see that uh, we could call that, say, P2, Q2. So this increase in demand drives up the market price, the equilibrium quantity increases, and really that's the analysis that you would do in a, a, a principles of micro class. What we're going to be doing now is, in this class, we're going to be thinking about the, the math behind this, and it's not going to be hard. I mean, the most complicated things that we're going to be doing are going to be setting two equations equal to each other and solving. Um, so don't be intimidated by that. But this is just a line, this, dem excuse me, this demand curve. Demand curves don't have to be linear. We'll talk about that here in our next video. But you could think about the functional form for this demand curve and the functional form for that supply curve. And once you know the functional forms for them, then we can solve 
for what that number is and what that number is. So rather than just saying that, that P star is our initial price and Q star is our initial quantity, we could say that price starts out at $3.50 and our initial quantity starts out at 500 units, for example, and then we could think about that demand curve shifting and we can solve for the exact increase in price and the exact increase in quantity and that is much more useful. Just talking about P's and Q's and drawing lines on the board, that's okay if you're just trying to get kind of a basic level understanding of how markets work, but if you really want to put this into practice, we need to know what this demand curve looks like and what that supply curve looks like and what those numbers are. So that's what we're going to do in this class. But again, the, the math of it is not hard. It, it, we won't do anything more than basically a, an algebra level uh, mathematics. So I'll sometimes talk about the calculus behind some of the stuff that we do. But again, calculus isn't required for this class, and so I would not be testing anybody on the calculus of it. But if you have had any calculus, the most complicated calculus thing that, that we would ever do in a class like this would be to take a derivative. Again, we're not going to do that in this class, but I might show you it. Um, so don't be intimidated by the math because that's not going to be challenging. But that doesn't mean that it won't be um, a little bit of a challenge to get up to speed. For some students in an intermediate micro class, it's been a while since they've had an algebra class or maybe their college algebra class. And so sometimes initially the, the doing the algebra, gathering terms and getting things from one side to the other and maybe finding a common denominator so that you can simplify something. It's been a while since some people have done those things and so there might be a little bit of catching up that you need to do, and I can help with that. I've got practice problems, I've got worksheets. Um, so as we go through this, I hope that you see that the math of it is not hard, but if there's anything that you haven't done in a while and you just would like a little bit of practice to uh, catch back up, we can do that. Let's talk about kind of what these functions are going to look like. We're always going to be using linear demand curves and supply curves because that makes our life very easy. Let's just review what a line looks like. If we think about the, the slope intercept form of a line, it's typically written like this, y equals mx plus b. Now here the two variables I'm going to be using are going to be x and y. Those are right there. Those would be like what we're using here, Q and P. Usually in a math class, you would have a picture where you've got X down here and Y up there. Okay, and so if we're thinking about the functional form of a line, it's going to be Y equals MX plus B, where this B is your vertical intercept, and this M right there is your slope. And remember that the slope is just the rise over the run. And so over here, wherever this line hits the vertical axis, that would be B. Let's give it a negative slope like a demand curve would have. So if this thing comes down here like this, the slope is right there. There's M. Okay. So if you've got a picture and you can look and see the number for that intercept, and you can calculate from the picture of the slope, this rise over this run, then you can easily form this function. Why? You just plug in whatever the intercept is and whatever the slope is. Or if you were starting with this, if I were to give you the functional form, like say for example, let's suppose we had y equals 10, minus 2x. There's a nice simple functional form of a line and what that is is a line that has as a vertical intercept 10. Its slope is negative 2 so you go down 2 units over 1, down 2, over 1. So by the time you've gone down 10 you will have gone over 5 and so this thing comes down and hits right there. We would put x down here, y up here. So if it's been a little while since you've done that kind of stuff, then again, there, there 
are some resources in the textbook. You can look, there's a math review there. If you want to just kind of run through some of that. Um, there's all kinds of resources online. If you were to go to Khan Academy or any of a thousand other places, you can get a little bit of practice doing these things. And if you're not sure about any of that, you can come talk to me and we can figure it out. Um, another concept that we're going to be thinking about in this class that, that you would have seen a little bit in a principles class, most likely, is the concept of tangency. And so let's just kind of review what that means. So for two geometric objects to be tangent to each other, that means that their slope at one point is going to be equal. So if we were to think about, say, a line, let's put down here a line, and then a curve that's just tangent to it, that means it comes down and it touches in one place, and at that point, the slope of this line and the slope of that curve are going to be equal, okay? At exactly that point. At any other place, we can see that the slopes are not going to be equal. Now, the place that you would have seen this, and we'll review this towards the end of the semester, but the place you would have seen this is in the context of monopolistic competition. With monopolistic competition, we know that there's free entry into that market. And so in the long run, in that type of market, profit gets driven to zero. And so in the long run, in a monopolistically competitive market, what we end up with is a situation where the demand curve that the firm faces ends up being just tangent to its average total cost curve. And so you would have seen a picture that's something like this. Um, but again, we'll go back and we'll review that in this class. But this concept of tangency, we're going to use a lot in the first half of this course because we're going to be talking about utility maximization. We're going to be talking about things that are known as indifference curves and budget constraints. And what we're going to see is that we get a picture that ends up looking a lot like this. We're going to have two geometric objects that are tangent to each other. We'll also see this in the model of firm cost minimization, where there we're going to have isoquants and isocost curves. But we'll get an outcome, an equilibrium, where two things are tangent to each other. And so that reviewing this idea of tangency is, is important. What I always tell my classes is that as we start with this and as we kind of start doing some of the math of it, if at any point you feel like you're starting to fall behind or you think, oh gosh, I'm not real sure how that works, but I'm going to ignore that and just hope I don't see it again, don't do that. It's a much better strategy to just send me a note and um, say, hey, I didn't, I didn't quite get that. And, and it might be just a matter of me explaining it again and then you get it. It might just be a matter of doing a few practice problems, um, but we can do that. That's a lot better than just hoping you don't see it again and then realizing that it turned out to be something that caused a big problem. So this is just kind of an introduction to um, intermediate micro. What we're going to do in our next video is we're going to start by thinking about this demand and supply model. We'll review how it works, the determinants of demand and supply, and then we'll start just kind of working through some of the uh, math of it. So I will see you in the next video.